A very good evening and a warm welcome to all our viewers. I am Dr. Shithil from the Clinical Engagement Team here at DocLexis. Welcome to a brand new session of the Dent Essentials. Oral health practitioners are seeing a higher incidence of xerostomia and Jogren syndrome than ever before. It is due to an aging population and a great reliance on drugs and therapies that cause xerostomia. The dental specialist must know of uh, the xerostomia symptoms and signs, consider Jogren's syndrome in their differential diagnosis and promptly share their findings and concerns with other medical professionals such as primary care doctors, rheumatologists and ophthalmologists for evaluation. To tell us more on this, we have with us today Dr. Devani Bal, who is well-known and experienced maxillofacial consultant with expertise in oral and maxillofacial surgery, cosmetology, and emergency care. She is an avid researcher and the associate editor of Curious. In addition, Dr. Bal is also a reviewer for reputed journals like Medicon, ACTA Scientific, and the Journal of MAR Dental Sciences and Oral Rehabilitation. She has several publications in national and international peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Bal has also published a book, namely Endoscopic Assisted Surgery in Maxillofacial Trauma, A New Outlook. She is currently pursuing a research fellowship with Cleft Childhood International Zurich from Nitte Minakshi Institute of Craniofacial Surgery. We welcome you, Dr. Devyani. You may proceed with your webinar. It's a pleasure to host you here today. Hello, everyone. So this is Dr. Devyani Bahen, and I shall be taking a, a lecture on Jogren syndrome from a dentist's perspective. So before I begin, I would like to thank Docplexus for giving me this platform to share my knowledge with all of you. So let us begin with it. So my PPT today will have the following learning objectives for everyone. We should understand what the Jogren syndrome is, what are the types of Jogren syndrome, what shall be the etiological factors, and how does a patient present to the clinical uh, uh, setup with a Jogren syndrome. We next move on to the diagnosis, the treatment modalities, and most importantly, how dentists are supposed to manage a patient in their dental setup when they face a patient with Jogren syndrome. So let us begin with the presentation. What is Jogren syndrome? As most of us are aware, Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune chronic salivary gland disorder that is can be multifactorial and it mostly affects the females. Why is it important for the dental practitioner? Because we are maybe the first ones to recognize the symptoms of this disease and give a definitive diagnosis to the patients. So earlier, the di uh, diagnosis of Jogren syndrome was based on a triad of three clinical factors. First was dry eyes, which is xerophthalmia. Second is dry mouth, which is, which is xerostomia. And third was a systemic autoimmune disorder, which is rheumatoid arthritis. This was given some years back. However, now clinically, the rheumatoid arthritis can be seen in combination with many other systemic autoimmune disorders. So it is not limited only to rheumatoid arthritis. The main criteria for diagnosis, however, still remains xerophthalmia and xerostomia. Now, Jogren syndrome can clinically present in two types. One is the primary Jogren syndrome. So what do we mean by primary Jogren syndrome? In this, the patients present with either xerophthalmia or xerostomia only. That is, they will present to you in a clinical setup with only dry eyes or only dry mouth. So this is also referred to as the Sika syndrome. In this primary Jogren syndrome, there is no associated autoimmune disorder which can be seen in the patients. So the second type is the secondary Jogren syndrome. In this, the patients present with the symptoms of Sika syndrome However, it is also associated with an autoimmune disorder such as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, lupus erythematosus, polyarthritis nodosa, etc. 
So the basic difference between primary and secondary Jogren syndrome is the presence of a systemic autoimmune disease, which is only seen in secondary Jogren syndrome. So these disorders which are autoimmune are mostly the connective tissue disorders which can be seen. There are also other disorders which have been named such as primary biliary, primary biliary cirrhosis, which can be also seen in association with Jogren syndrome patients. Coming to the etiological factors of this disease. Till date, a lot of research has been done, but the etiology of Jogren syndrome is unknown. Like I've mentioned earlier, it is said to be a multifactorial autoimmune systemic disease. Hence, the first primary etiology which can be thought of is an immunologic mechanism, which is the intrinsic factor for the uh, primary etiology of the disease. Second, there is also an evidence of genetic influence. Uh, I would like to make clear here that these are just the thought uh, etiological factors. Nothing has been established as such, but with an ongoing research, it is said that immunologic mechanism and genetic fact factors prove to be etiologic cause of the disease. Next, there has been also some uh, evidences showing viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus or the human T-cell lymphotropic virus that they may have a pathogenetic role in the development of the disease. Now let us understand the clinical features or the clinical presentation when a patient comes to the OPD. So how are you supposed to diagnose if a patient is having Jogren syndrome or not based just on the clinical features? I have already mentioned earlier that dry eyes and dry mouth, xerosthalmia and xerostomia are the primary diagnostic features of this disease. Mostly, the patients, when they appear to come for a diagnosis, they are over 40 years of age. Females to males ratio is around 10 is to 1. So, for every 5% of females being affected, there is a 0.5% chance of a male being affected. So, this disease is commonly found in females and in patients of over 40 years of age. As we have mentioned earlier, this disease involves the salivary glands and hence parotid gland is the most frequently involved. So clinically, there may be an associated swelling over the parotid gland area due to parotid gland enlargement. Since the mucous membranes and the mucus moisture secreting glands of the eyes are affected, so the lacrimal glands and the salivary glands are usually affected first, leading to decreased tears and hyposalivation. Due to this, there will be associated pain, burning sensation, ulceration of the eyes or of the oral mucosa. The eyes will always feel as if you have a stone or a gravel or some kind of sand in them. The mouth feels as if it's full of cotton and it makes it difficult for the patient to speak. So if a patient comes to you uh, in the clinical OPD and he explains of having a sensation of having sand in the eyes or his mouth being full and his inability to speak and swallow, and all this is accompanied by hyposalivation and decreased tears, then you should definitely give a chance for diagnosis of Chopin syndrome. There is also associated hyposecretion of various other glands, which can be the nasal glands, the bronchial glands, or the vaginal glands, etc. As mentioned earlier, it is associated with one of the autoimmune disease, mostly rheumatoid arthritis is the most frequently seen disease. Apart from that, systemic lupus erythematosus and polyarthritis nodosa may also be seen frequently associated in patients with Jogren syndromes. So, here I have a clinical picture demonstrating the common symptoms. So let us revise once. So we have the ocular and the oral symptoms beginning with dry eyes, dry mouth, dry throat. Due to the hyposalivation and decrease in the quantity of saliva, there can be increased risk of dental decay and caries in such patients, which is to be kept in mind. Hyposalivation also paves a way for most fungal infections orally, hence candidiasis may also be a diagnostic feature which can be seen in Jogren syndrome patients. There will be digestive issues since it is an autoimmune disease affecting the connective tissues. 
Uh, joint pain, as seen in rheumatoid arthritis, will be another most common feature of the disease. Due to this, there may be associated fatigue in such patients. Associated enlargement of lymph nodes may also be seen, and all these clinical features shall pave a way for you for diagnosis of the Chogren syndrome. Definitely, any clinical presentation, unless combined with diagnostic modalities, cannot confirm a disease. However, you can always go for the uh, for a, a supposed diagnosis for such diseases. So now coming to the diagnosis, uh, since we have uh, oral and the ocular mucosa affected first, so we can do a test called as the Shermer's test for the eyelid. So this test actually assesses the amount of tears being secreted by the eyes. So this test consists of placing a thin strip of filter paper in the lower eyelid or the lower conjunctival sac. This assesses the me or measures the tear production. A normal patient will usually wet around 15 mm of the filter paper in 5 minutes. Please see the picture on the side and it, can, it is clearly depicting as to what will be the uh, results of the disease. In the first case, we can see that there is insufficient tear production because it is less than 5 mm. In the second case, we can see that the marking is in somewhere between 5 more than 10 mm. So there is a possible shortage of tears. We cannot diagnose it at Straubin syndrome immediately. In the normal tear production, the patient is almost wetting 15 mm of the filter paper in 5 minutes. So this is a most important diagnostic test for Chogren syndrome, Shermer's test. Second is the Rose Bengal dye test. This is also done for ocular symptoms. It is generally done by an ophthalmologist to detect any damaged or denuded areas of the cornea, since this may also pave a way for decreased secretion of the tears. It is very necessary to analyze if there is any uh, if there is any damage to the corneal in the eye. The third is the breakup time or the beauty test. This is also performed by an ophthalmologist and this is done using a slit lamp magnifying device. In this, there is an interval which is noticed between a normal complete blink and the appearance of a dry spot on the cornea. Based on this, they give a score and the score is given as 0, which is the minimum score. Maximum score is the 9. If a patient has dry eyes, he will blink more than four times in the breakup time test. So um, any blink more than four times reveals that the patient has dry eyes. Due to dry eyes and less secretion of tears, he will end up blinking more so that he gets his eyes remain wet. So these three are the most important ocular tests which need to be performed. First is the Schirmer's test. Second is the Rose Bengal dye test. And third is the breakup time test. Next, we come to assess the hyposalivation or the decrease in the salivary gland production. And for this, we need to assess the salivary gland function, which is done by salivary gland scintigraphy or parotid salivography. It basically assesses the flow rate of saliva, which is being secreted by the salivary gland. If the unstimulated whole, rate, whole saliva flow rate is less than 1.5 ml, over 15 minutes, then the person is diagnosed to have serostomia. Also, we can go for blood tests which show anti-nuclear antibodies which are definitely positive in such patients. Two nuclear anti autoantibodies commonly known as anti-Rho and anti-La are frequently found in patients presenting with primary Jogren syndrome. Also, there is an 80% increase of ESR along with the positive rheumatoid factor in the patients presenting with Chogren syndrome. So for salivary gland function, we need to uh, undertake salivary gland scintigraphy or parotid salivography to assess the saliva flow rate. And the blood parameters may be checked up for autoantibodies, anti rho and anti la along with the increased ESR and a positive rheumatoid factor. Now when we come the histopathology or the microscopic presentation of the disease, since we are already undertaking a salography for the salivary gland function, 
we can often see that the presentation in salography is that of a cherry blossom or a branchless fruit laden tree and this is very characteristic of chogren syndrome in this this is due to because the cavities are filled with radio opaque contrast material so we can see only the branches so hence it is known as cherry blossom appearance and this is very characteristic of chogren syndrome also there is lymphocytic infiltration of the salivary gland with the destruction of the acinar units hence the contrast media in case of a salography is not picked up by these units the picture is demonstrated here and it is very commonly seen in chogren syndrome patients when they are undergoing a parotid gland salography now coming to a recently given diagnostic criteria by the american european census group that is the aecg they gave a revised international classification criteria for chogren syndrome in 2002 in this we have to undertake the six parameters which have been mentioned first if the ocular symptom symptoms are present if any one of the ocular symptoms such as daily persistent dry eyes for over 3 months recurrent sensation of or feeling of grittiness in the eye or if the patient is using a tear substitute for more than 3 times a day so if any of these symptoms are present along with one of the oral symptoms such as a dry mouth for over 3 months recurrent or persistent salivary gland swelling or liquid intake to eat swallowing food along with presence of ocular signs that is already explained before the shermer's test or the rose bengal score any of this is positive and we see histopathologically that there is focal lymphocytic salidinitis and the uh, for glandular tissue the score is less than or equal to 1 per 4 mm square so this will be confirmed by a histopathologist when you give them the sample of the salivary gland uh the other important feature which would help in diagnosis is already mentioned as salography or an unstimulated salivary flow which is less than or equal to 1.5 ml in 15 minutes the presence of auto antibodies like anti ro and anti la in the uh, blood sample of the patient so combining all of these will give you a definitive diagnosis for chogren syndrome these six are the criteria given by american european consensus group the aecj and they give the international classification criteria which is to be kept in mind for giving a definitive diagnosis for patients with chogren syndrome now once you have diagnosed a patient with chogren syndrome the most important aspect which comes is the managing of the patient so what treatment would you give in such patients since the etiological cause of this disease is yet unknown we need to give only supportive treatment which may help to aid or relieve the symptoms of these patients so it is basically on the parts of the body which are mainly affected that is the eyes and the mouth so we all usually prescribe them with over the counter eye drops and often tell the patients to keep sipping water frequently uh, they may a few patients who have more severe progression of the disease may definitely need more prescribed medications and even surgical procedures but surgical procedures are seldom undertaken so we stick to the medical therapy uh, to decrease the eye inflammation we ask the patients to use artificial tears or prescribe them eye drops which increase the production of uh, tears in their eyes such as cyclosporin uh, or liftograst so these are the names they may be recommended for moderate to severe dry eyes they can also uh, wear sealed glasses so that you know the tear film is prevented from drying up very easily and there is less of contact with the environmental factors topical antibiotics such as sulfacetamide or ophthalmologic gentamicin can also be prescribed because due to decreased uh, production of tears such patients may also be prone to eye infections so to prevent those antibiotics may be prescribed to them to increase the production of saliva generally patients are being told 
to keep chewing a sugarless candy or a gum to keep their mouth moist. So this will stimulate the salivary glands to produce the necessary amount of saliva required. In UK recently, drugs such as pilocarpin is very much under the uh, uh, is given for the treatment for Chopin syndrome. Very frequently, it is being made uh, uh, that the it has been made the standard treatment for treating the patients who have high hyposalivation due to Jogren syndrome. But it can have side effects, which may include sweating and abdominal pain and uh, flushing also. Most commonly, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs drugs are often given to treat patients because they have connective tissue uh, disorders. So they may have joint pains associated fatigue and stiffness of the joint. So NSAIDs may be given to give them symptomatic relief from pain. As mentioned earlier, there may be probable or possible causes of yeast infections. Hence, they need to be treated with antifungal medications orally. Recent researches have also shown, but it is not well much into the uh, medical field that hydrochloroquine which is generally used to treat malaria is often helpful in treatment of Jogren syndrome. No evidence has been established as yet in uh, India as such. So this is still under the research. <laughs> Sorry. A minor procedure may also be used to seal the tear ducts that drain the tears from the eyes. So this may help to prevent the tear film from drying and prevent to and helps, uh, help in relieving the dry eyes. Many ophthalmologists also prescribe collagen or silicone plugs which can be inserted into the ducts to preserve the tears. So the medical management of Chogren syndrome is always supportive because there is no definitive cause so there is no definitive treatment. You have to treat the patient based on the symptoms the patient is presenting to you with. And you need to categorize if the symptoms of the patient are falling into mild category, if they are moderate or if they are severe. And based on that, you need to assess if the patient requires over-the-counter drugs or if he requires more, uh, more strong drugs such as pilocarpin in order to relieve them of the symptomatic pain. Now, the most important part comes because as dentists, we may be the first people to diagnose that a patient has Dogman syndrome or not. Many of these patients often go undiagnosed till the age of 40 to 50. So till their fifth or sixth decade of life, they're mostly undiagnosed. They may not be aware that they have Jogren syndrome until and unless they present to a dentist and they show some typical sim symptoms which have been already described above. So many a times you may have a patient in the clinical setup who may complain to you having dry mouth and he may also be having inability to wear denture due to the dryness and the sensitivity of the oral mucosa. It is not necessary that all patients fall into this category. However, when you understand that a patient is complaining to you of dry mucosa, it needs to ring. It need to ring a bell in your head that it can be a patient of Jogren syndrome, and you need to diagnose it more specifically. And ask the patient about the associated disease uh, symptoms as well. So, if a patient or uh, an already diagnosed patient of Jogren syndrome comes to you for a dental treatment you need to give the patient first of all a thorough cleanup and then you need to advise the topical fluoride to be applied for preventing dental caries because hyposalivation gives a pay for uh, dental increase in dental caries and dental decay. So the patients need to be very thorough with their oral hygiene. Fluorexity mouthwash may be uh, prescribed to the patients or it can be used as varnish or gel. So as it is an uh, antiseptic, so it will help to reduce the growth of microorganisms. Topical fluoride is to be used on all the teeth to as a preventive method and also in those cases where dental decay has already started. Also non-fluoride immunizing agents can be given uh, in, as an adjunct therapy 
uh there have been very uh, many cases where in patients are unable to wear the dentures in those cases uh, a few studies have reported that we can give them dental implants however the life of those implants will not be as much as it is in the normal patients those implants have a failure in almost 40% of the times so if a patient suppose has a, a normal patient has a life of dental implant say for say about 10 to 20 years of uh, a dental implant life in the jogging syndrome patient will definitely be lesser than that and it lasts for almost 5 to 6 years so all these aspects of treatment need to be explained to the patients beforehand so dental practitioners uh, play a very important role in the diagnosis and management of the oral manifestations of patients with jogging syndrome and as i'm emphasizing it again and again many or very often dentists are the first people to diagnose jogging syndrome in a clinical opd so you need to be alert you need to keep your eyes open as to what are the symptoms how is the pre- patient presenting to you because everything falls into place when you cl- correctly diagnose a disorder so you need to be aware and uh, you should follow the recent guidelines and recent updates for any kind of disease not only for this for any kind of diseases and diagnostic criteria there are uh, recent updates and those should be kept in mind and that is how you should look at each patient because each patient may present similarly there may be two presentations of the same case but definitely there will be some kind of uh, a clinical feature which may be different from the others or maybe in the diagnosis uh, diagnostic modality you can see that how different this case is from others so this is it from my side uh, thank you so much i hope i could update whatever the recent findings were in the treatment uh, management especially and the diagnostic criteria for jogren syndrome thank you it was absolutely wonderful listening to you very well presented session we have a few questions from the audience with your permission let's go on to the first question my first question to you is what is the prevalence of oral manifestations in patients with primary jogren syndrome versus secondary jogren syndrome actually the primary and secondary jogren syndrome is basically for oral manifestations they will present 100% of presentation will be there in both it is just the association of an autoimmune systemic disorder which will not be present in a primary whereas it will be present in the secondary disease so a jogren sin- jogren syndrome is basically a disorder of the salivary and the lacrimal glands so they will have 100% presentation either dry eyes or dry mouth and usually it is a combination of both so if a patient comes to you with a uh, complaint of having dry eyes you should the next question should automatically be if he or she is suffering from dry mouth as well so that gives a connection and that also leads to if you know the patient is having jogren syndrome or not well explain going on to the next question what is the association between oral manifestation of jogren syndrome and the presence of specific antibodies such as anti ro ssa and anti la ssb antibodies these uh, auto anti uh, so like i said uh, the etiology of jogren syndrome is not known it is only hypothesized that it can be due to an autoimmune disorder which is that is an immunological immunologic factor is uh, paving the way for this disease so uh, auto antibodies are again with the if a patient is presenting with jogren syndrome it is definite that the patient will have uh, auto antibodies and when he is having oral symptoms and ocular symptoms so it is again a one is to one association it is 100% that they will have the uh, auto antibodies there are many other antibodies so there are actually 12 antibodies which can be uh, diagnosed in uh, a patient with jogren syndrome but anti ro and anti la are the most common antibodies which are seen in patients so apart from those the other minor antibodies which are there they may or may not be present thank you for that elaborate answer my third question is 
what are the long term outcomes of patients with jogren syndrome and severe oral manifestation who undergo salivary gland transplantation or stem cell therapy right uh, long term effects of jogren syndrome if it is if the patient is not falling under a very severe category a mild to moderate aspect of the disease is generally managed with over the counter drugs and giving the uh, prescribing the patients with uh, artificial tears or artificial salivary substitutes so that generally gives a supportive therapy to the patient however in patients who present with severe aspect of the disease probably due to the immunologic factor so it can lead to even uh, destruction of the salivary gland which is why they may need to undergo the salivary gland transplantation so this comes uh, this comes in very extremely severe cases and it is not very commonly seen it is very rare to see such cases where salivary gland transplantation is needed because salivary gland is the basic organ producing the saliva and saliva is required for most of the basic needs for chewing for swallowing even for talking so if the gland is completely destructed because i mentioned in my uh, histopathologic uh, microscopic view that the acinar units of the salivary glands are destructed com- uh, mostly in this disease if they're destructed completely acinar units are the ones which aid in the production of saliva or the saliva is produced in these acinar units so if the destruction is complete the salivary gland is completely destructed so in that cases yes stem cell therapy is emerging now so that can be used to regenerate those areas or a complete transplantation of the salivary gland may be required in extremely severe cases thank you for answering that this brings us to the end of this session thank you so much dr devyani for your time and effort in putting together this interesting session to our dear viewers thank you so much for attending this session to share any more questions if you have until we see you again take care and happy dog flexing thank you